get started. Well, thank you for coming. I really appreciate everybody turning out. Um, so uh, I'm Ellen Hendrickson, and my podcast is Savvy Psychologist. I've been doing it for about four years. I'm on episode 220, and it's gotten me nine million downloads. I think we're at so far. Whoa. So, so we're getting, we're, we're <laughs> it's it's chugging along. <laughs> And, uh, and so, um, if you've listened to the show before, you know one of my favorite topics is uh, kind of some umbrella of like, insecurity, social anxiety, confidence, and so I'm going to do a big mashup of favorite uh, topics. And then, since there are, you know, a, a few of us, like, we can also make this a conversation, so I'll have time at the end for questions, but if you have a question in the middle, just feel free to, to ask if you make this. Pretty informal. So nothing like a close up of jello shots to start up the presentation. <laughs> but all right, so on the show, I have discovered from feedback that I'm known for my metaphors and similes. So I'm gonna start you out with three. Alright, we all have those moments when our confidence has the consistency of jello. We feel more insecure than a retirement account invested in a Ponzi scheme. Or more insecure than when your password is password. So alright, but regardless of whether you call this self-doubt, insecurity uncertainty, social anxiety, inhibition, it's all under that big umbrella of insecurity. And it is a universal part of the human condition, so you are not alone in your stuff. Uh, so, but, you know, regardless, it is still a drag. So together, for the next 15 or so minutes, let's talk about five ways, well, let's first let's talk about why it sticks around, and then let's talk about five ways to fight it. So, here we go. All right. <laughs> so there is a <coughs> cognitive side to insecurity. We all have those self-depths that run through our heads, like this bee here. We second-guess ourselves, we beat ourselves up, and we generally fret about you know, reaching our own standards. But there's also a physical side to insecurity. So with just like, like okay, so depression, you know, feels heavy and slow, and you feel like you're moving through mud. Anger is like quick and hot. So insecurity feels shaky and uncertain and often includes this urge to hide. And so this might this feeling might appear for our external self. So we can probably all relate to the feeling of standing and looking in the mirror in the morning and seeing something we are not happy with. So maybe we have a big zit, or maybe we're having a bad hair day, or maybe we think our outfit looks weird. So what happens is we we try to change. We and if we can't change it, like we can't throw on some tinted moisturizer or we like comb our hair over our face. Um, we feel self-conscious. That's that's that feeling of, of insecurity. But that feeling can also happen for the inside. We might think that we're awkward or annoying or boring or stupid or incompetent or any of a million other not good enough traits. But so either way, you know, our body and our thoughts are connected. And so that perception, and I want to emphasize perception that something is wrong with us, you know, feeds that urge to hide. And so we think that unless we work really hard to try to conceal that perceived, again, perceived flaw, um, it'll become obvious to everybody and then we'll be judged or rejected for it. Okay. Now, this can cross a line into, you know, distress and impairment, which is the definition of a, you know, mental health disorder. So the you know psychology as a profession has codified insecurity so at 13 at some point in life 13 percent of americans will cross that line into social anxiety disorder meaning that it's some kind of insecurity that gets in the way of living your life so this is where you know, class participation points are deliberately forgone like well i'm not going to raise my hand so i guess all i can get is an 80. or you pass up a promotion because it would involve public speaking or invitations are turned down because you suspect your friends are only inviting you out of pity. So when it when it crosses that line into affecting your life, then it becomes um, the definition of a disorder. But regardless, when it, it's it's happening, any even if it doesn't get in the way of your life, if you're kicking yourself like this is stupid, like why can't I do this? What is wrong with me? The answer is nothing. You know, social anxiety is a disorder because our perceived flaw is just that. It is a perception. So, okay. Now, so if insecurity causes all this misery and hand-wringing and can become a disorder, like why did it stick around through millennia of evolution? Like what use does this have? Like why did it not fall away with our tails or get treated for opposable thumbs? Or like why, why do we each have our own insecurities? Okay, so it turns out that insecurity is not an oversight of evolution. And in fact, it is necessary 
because a healthy dose of self-doubt spurs us to look inward, to be introspective, and to monitor ourselves and our interactions. And so basically, it helps us identify how to get along better with our fellow humans. So I like to say that we doubt ourselves in order to check ourselves. And those doubts buy us at least three things. So the first is plain old safety. So uh, Dr. Cynthia Garcia Cole, she was still a grad student here at Harvard in 1984, she coined the term behavioral inhibition. And that is the inborn tendency, it's a trait, to withdraw from unfamiliar situations, people, and environments. So basically, it's our degree of caution when faced with novelty. And so you don't just see it when you know toddlers like hide under their mom's skirt, or your cat goes, you know, hides under the bed when company arrives. Like any organism, from like bacteria to fish to modern Americans, um, with in any species, behavior inhibition wires us to look before we leap, which is something this penguin could have used a little more of, perhaps. Um, but essentially, it's, it's, it's designed, I think this must be fake, but anyway, it's designed to keep us safe and ultimately designed to keep us alive so that we can propagate for you know, the next generation. Okay, so that's one thing that insecurity buys us. The second thing is to so okay so to illustrate the importance of insecurity, it's important to look at its opposite. So let's let's turn insecurity inside out like a tube sock. So what is the opposite of insecurity, and what would a psychology presentation be without pretty brain pictures? All right. So you might think the opposite of insecurity is confidence or fearlessness or like something that sounds really good, something that sounds amazing, but. Be careful what you wish for, because the 1% of the population that is completely free of insecurity is psychopaths. <laughs> and so it turns out that a total lack of insecurity is actually a sign of things gone wrong. So this image is from a study by Dr. Niels Burbaumer and his team. Um, and so they put folks with social anxiety disorder and criminal psychopaths, <laughs> I don't know how they recruited them, um, through an, an MRI scanner. And so the top row says HC, that stands for healthy controls. Um, the second row, SP, is social phobics, so that's sort of the old term for social anxiety. And the bottom row is psychopaths, PP. Um, okay, and so what did they find? They found that in social anxiety, that the, the, you know, the, the, there's this neural signature of a hair triggered social smoke alarm, and that is an overactive frontal limbal frontal limbic circuit. But in the second path, they found the exact opposite, an underactive frontal limbic circuit. And so other studies have happened since then uh, that bolstered this. And so the theory now is that psychopathy and social anxiety lie at opposite ends of the same spectrum. So because psychopath, psychopathy is dominated by two big traits, fearless dominance and self-centered impulsivity, which when you think about it, sounds like the opposite of folks with some behavioral inhibition or some social anxiety. Therefore, so a little, a little insecurity in each of us maintains social cohesion rather than letting random psychopaths pull down the whole group, which is very important. All right, and the third thing, speaking of groups, is that it gets us a group. We need a group. Unlike solitary species like tigers or bears, we, you know, like these monkeys, are social animals, and we are wired to live together. And so even if, you know, like online grocery delivery has supplanted, you know, having to go out and hunt and gather, we still need a group for community and belonging and plain old love. So a healthy dose of insecurity allows us to get along and stay safely in the fold. All right. All right, so I just made the case that insecurity is important and necessary, but it still blows. So <laughs> it makes us compare ourselves to others. We always come up short. It feels lousy. It makes us think the worst is inevitable and that we can't handle things. So what do we do? All right. We're going to walk through these five things. So the first is ditch the generic affirmations. All right. So I'm awesome. I'm the best. I'm going to kill it. Like all the generic phrases we like mutter to ourselves in a bathroom stall while we're standing in a power pose. Like, <laughs> 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 
they end up psyching us out. Why? Okay, because often they feel like a lie. You know, like you're like, I'm the best, and your little voice goes, No, you're not. And according to a study out of the University of Minnesota, it doesn't work particularly if psyching yourself up as the best is followed by a performance that's not the best, because that just kills your motivation and it can make you give up on your goals. Okay, so 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 don't do that. Like think of a you know a shy guy or a shy girl like trying to ask out their crush. If they you know psych themselves up with like I'm awesome and then get rejected, which they can't control, like are they ever gonna ask somebody out again? No, of course not, not for a long time. So ditch the generic affirmations and instead affirm your values. And I'll tell you what that means. Okay. So this is a study out of UCLA. This is David Creswell and Jones. <coughs> and they had 85 participants either write about a core value, something that was really important to them, or to write about a value that wasn't particularly important to them, maybe something that there was more important to their parents or a friend. Okay, then everybody went through a stress test that involved giving a speech in front of a stony panel of judges and doing mental subtraction <coughs> while a researcher timed them and yelled at them to go faster. So not fun, right? Okay. So then everybody spit in, well not everybody spit in the same cup, everybody spit in their own cup and their levels of cortisol, so a, which is a stress hormone, were, were measured. And the participants who affirmed their core values beforehand had significantly lower cortisol responses compared to the folks in the control condition. Okay. Now, the most interesting thing about the study, in my opinion, is that the, the value affirmation had nothing to do with the task at hand. If, like, if you write about like my family and the support they give me is something I know is real, or my faith, you know, with the divinity school, my faith, faith is the foundation of my life, or a sense of humor is what grounds me and connects me to others, that has nothing to do with giving a speech or doing mental subtraction, right? But it still shores you up. So. Next time you feel insecure before a stressful situation, so you're going to give a presentation, or you've got a job interview, remind yourself of who you are and what is important to you, because that is way more effective than if I'm awesome. So, okay, to be clear, uh, we're not talking about performance. We're not, we are talking about values. So an example of performance is, I'm a good student. That's kind of the I'm awesome category. Whereas affirming your values, an example would be like, I strive for lifelong learning. Like, or I value my time with my children. Or I value making and sharing art, something like that. So go for, go for that version instead of I'm awesome. Okay, third is find your purpose. So another thing that offsets insecurity is purpose. And this is now a study of Cornell and it found that people with a sense of purpose were less swayed by feedback that they got on social media. So that's not to say that they didn't notice it, they didn't like notice how many likes they got, they didn't you know, read their comments, but they didn't rely on them to feed their self-esteem. And so for you, you know, think, you know, why were you put on this planet? Like, what do you care deeply about? And when you are busy you know, saving the world or you know, creating something that you care about or you know, pursuing a goal you truly believe to be worthwhile, like when you have a purpose, you magically care less about what people think of you. So that is number three. Okay. Number four is add yet. So now we're going to go over to Stanford and talk about Dr. Carol Dweck. So she is known the world over for her research on mindset. And I, I watched her TEDx talk, which is excellent. And in it, she describes a high school in Chicago uh, where if students have not passed a class, they don't get an F, they get the grade not yet. And okay, so what does this do? Well, it does something very important. It shifts the focus from outcome to process. And it moves students from the fixed mindset that she talks about. So this idea that your basic qualities, you know, like intelligence, are static and unchangeable and moves it to that of a growth mindset which proposes that your basic qualities can be developed. So it's, it moves it from looking at it like a talent, like you're just born with it, to a skill that you can work on and build. And in addition, this shift from outcome to process implies eventual success. It implies that you, know, you can do this eventually. And in the meantime, it makes you focus on effort and perseverance and resilience and strategy. So therefore, for your own endeavors, you know, rather than labeling a shortcoming, a failure, like I haven't lost 
those last 10 pounds. I can't sustain a meditation practice. I don't have you know, X number of downloads. Tap on the word yet, because I haven't lost those 10 pounds yet. I can't sustain a, sustain a meditation practice yet. I don't have whatever downloads yet. That's, that's really different. And so believing you can improve rather than being stuck, rather than being stuck with the cards you were dealt with, makes all the difference. All right. And the last one, it sounds cliche, but hear me out. So focus on being uniquely you. So this is one of my favorite studies. So, okay, especially at a conference for podcasters. So too often when we are feeling insecure, we try to copy someone else. We try to find a model that we can, um, like, we, we, we find somebody who we think has it all figured out and try to model our performance after them. So for the podcasters here, we might try to copy our favorite show, you know, or copy a show that's been successful, whatever that means. But by definition, when we copy, we're a copy. So I'm going to tell you about a study that was done here at Harvard. So this is Ellen Langer's work. And she asked an orchestra to play the same piece twice. It was Brahms Symphony No. 1, the fourth movement. And I'm going to read this. So in the first first go through, she said, think about the finest performance of this piece that you can remember and try to play it that way. Okay, so basically match the gold standard. Try to think about the best performance of this you've heard and try to reach that. Okay, second time around, she said, play this piece in the finest manner you can, offering subtle new nuances to your performance. All right, so put your own twist on it. All right, and then they asked everybody in the audience, which one did you like better? Not everybody had an opinion, but you know, most people did, and of those people, the majority preferred the second performance, preferred it when the, the musicians put their own twist on it. Now, these changes were really subtle. It might not even have been something that their, you know, their stand partner, who like sitting next to them, would have noticed. It could just be like a little bit more vibrato here, a little bit more, you know, something else there. It could be any little twist, but somehow it came across in the performance and was you know, noticed to the extent that people seemed to, to prefer that. When the musicians were mindfully engaged and put their own twist on it, it came out better. So instead of focusing on living up to a perceived standard, focus on making your own standard. So if you're you know, feeling insecure when launching your podcast, uh, you, again, you might be tempted to mold your show after a show that, that you really enjoy. But rather than just following their trail, like blaze your own trail. It can be really subtle. Um, it doesn't have to be a big spectacle, but stay attuned to what you're curious about and ask what do you find compelling? What do you have to say? And that will make all the difference. All right, so to wrap it all up, insecurity is a package deal. So it comes bundled with some really valuable skills that I think we often overlook. People who are socially anxious or insecure or unsure of themselves are often really high in conscientiousness, meaning they're like responsible and uh, reliable, we have very high standards, a strong work, work ethic, empathy, you know, tendency to work hard and getting along with people. Because if you roll back caring what people think of you, you just get caring about people. And I think that in today's world, you know, a fractious world, um, that's a skill that is, that is, you know, can't be emphasized enough. Plus, it's way better than being a psychopath. So, <laughs> we can wrap that up and with a bow and take it home. And I'd be happy to answer questions either about the presentation or the show. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So, so um, based on what you said for number one, you're not a fan of fake it till you make it, or no, do you believe it? Or? I actually am a fan of fake it till okay. you make it. Yeah, I think. Um, okay. So I guess what I was railing against was the trying to make your trying to change your thoughts before you try the thing. Okay. That, that's actually backwards. And so I think what, what happens, um, when, when confidence is actually built, we do the thing before we're ready, like before we're confident about it. And then we say, hey, I just did that. Like you watch yourself do it and then you start to believe you can. Mm -hmm. And, and like if you do that over and over again, iteratively, then the thoughts catch up. Okay. Yeah, you can't put the thoughts first, okay. you have to put the behavior first. Uh, I haven't heard your podcast. That's okay. But I will. Uh, do you do Q and A, and um, what kind of cues do you get? Sure. So, um, so my podcast is uh, short, and I try to make it actionable. 
And most of the time, it's a monologue. It's me talking. <laughs> and, and so um, once in a while, I will do an interview. I'd say maybe every six weeks, um, I'll do an interview, usually with an author of a book that I find interesting. Um, and so I guess for the cues, they are what I want to learn from that author or that researcher. Oh, so you don't have a call it's not a call in. It is not a call in show. Okay. Correct. I do take requests. And so the best the best episodes, in my personal opinion, that I've ever done have been um, requests. And so like people will email me and say, Oh, could you talk about this? And I'll say, Oh my goodness, why did I not think of that? That's an amazing topic. And those inevitably end up being the best. So the, I think that in the Tango message I've gotten from this conference is to basically do that more, like ask your listeners, ask yeah. the people who are engaged with your show what they want to learn and what they'd like to hear because that is going to generate like a really interesting conversation. I have so, two more questions. Yeah, of how long is your podcast number one mm -hmm. and how frequent? Uh, it comes out every Friday. Okay. It's a weekly show and uh, if it's just me monologue it's like 13 minutes oh. which takes like a good six to eight hours to write like it's, yeah. like that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it, this is, this is, it's definitely a labor of love. Um, and if it's a if it is an interview, then anywhere from twenty to forty, I guess. Yeah, I think forty was the the outlier. But well, yeah. just one more question: yeah, Have you monetized it? So okay, it is through Macmillan Publishing, which is um, the only one of the big five publishers that has a podcast network. So there, you know, there's certainly the milieu of publishing is changing and so they're working really hard to, to keep up with the times or, or, or lead the changes that publishing is, is going to go through. Um, so, you know, I, I make a little bit, not enough to live on through just the podcast, um, but, but yeah, we have advertisers and, and you know, Big Millen clearly thinks it's worth keeping it going. Yeah. Yes. Would you consider co-hosting another podcast? Yes. 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 Okay, cool. So it's interesting that you ask that because um, so I've been doing this for four years and I am at the point where I think it's ready to um, to go to the next phase like the next iteration and so I'm actually thinking about like what do I want to keep and what I want to jettison and a co-host would be super cool. Um, I don't know. It's it's unclear where it's going to go, but okay, cool. I would like I'll to email you because I think you'd be. An amazing co-host for one of the podcasts that we produce. Oh, interesting. Yeah, okay. like your style. Sure, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Very PG. Sounds good. Other questions? How did you get started doing the podcast and how did you sure. build a listener base? Yeah, um, so I I got into podcasting because, oddly, because I wanted to be a writer. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I would, Five years ago, I was kind of this drifting academic, and I was not really satisfied with, just on the personal side, like just writing grants and papers. And I was also, on the kind of broader side, frustrated that all this cool stuff was happening in psychology research, and like nobody knew about it, and like nobody was benefiting, or if they were benefiting, it was like one person at a time, like in the therapy room or like in studies. And so I was wondering how how can how can we push this out into the world, and so I, I, I knew I wanted to write, and I, I had a dream to write a book, but the way publishing goes these days is that you kind of have to bring your own audience. And so I used QDT, because I, um, I was familiar with Grammar Girl, and so I literally just cold emailed the editor and said, hey, I noticed you have this network and you don't have a mental health person, and what, do you need someone? And, and she said, let's, let's try it out. And so. I wrote some articles for the website, and she said, we're going to run you, uh, you against, I think it was a, a wine expert and like a real estate person, and we'll, just, we'll see who gets the most hits. And I'm not tooting my own horn, but I was like, psychology is going to win out because people want to know about themselves. You know, people want to, know, like, want to hear about their quirks and foibles. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so one thing led to another, and she said, okay, here, like, we'll send you a microphone, go do it. And I got this microphone and I was like, wait a minute, I got into this to be a writer and now I have to talk. So, so it's been so interesting hearing everybody talk about like the people who do have podcasts talk about their first episodes and like how cringeworthy they are now and that's definitely what happened. So I've learned in public but I think I found my voice and I love doing this and uh, yeah, it's it's been super cool. 
I think we have time for one more. It's 229. <laughs> what was the name of the, the psychologist who coined uh, behavioral inhibition? Cynthia Garcia Cole. Thank you. Yes, Cole. Mm -hmm. Stephen Feldau. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for coming.